fifteen. A few hours later, Lady Kelsey's dance was in full swing, and to all appearances it was a great success. Many people were there, and everyone seemed to enjoy himself. On the surface, at all events, there was nothing to show that anything had occurred to disturb the evening's pleasure, and for most of the party, the letter in the Daily Mail was no more than a welcome topic of conversation. Presently, Canon Spratter went into the smoking room. He had on his arm, as was his amiable habit, the prettiest girl at the dance, Grace Vizard, a niece of that Lady Vizard, who was a pattern of all the proprieties and a devout member of the Church of Rome. He found that Mrs. Crowley and Robert Bolger were already sitting there, and he greeted them courteously. I really must have a cigarette, he said, going up to the table on which were all the necessary things for refreshment. If you press me dreadfully, I'll have one too, said Mrs. Crowley, with a flash of her beautiful teeth. Don't press her, said Bobby. She's had six already, and in a moment she'll be seriously unwell. Well, I'll forgo the pressing, but not the cigarette. Canon Spratter gallantly handed her the box and gave her a light. It's against all my principles, you know, he smiled. What is the use of principles except to give one an agreeable sensation of wickedness when one doesn't act up to them? The words were hardly out of her mouth when Dick and Lady Kelsey appeared. Dear Mrs. Crowley, you're as epigrammatic as a dramatist, he exclaimed. Do you say such things from choice or necessity? He had arrived late, and this was the first time she had seen him since they had all gone their ways before Whitson. He mixed himself a whiskey and soda. After all, is there anything you know so thoroughly insufferable as a ball? He said, reflectively, as he sipped it with great content. Nothing, if you ask me point-blank, said Lady Kelsey, smiling with relief, because he took so flippantly the news she had lately poured into his ear. But it's excessively rude of you to say so. I don't mind yours, Lady Kelsey, because I can smoke as much as I please and keep away from the sex which is technically known as fair. Mrs. Crowley felt the remark was directed to her. I'm sure you think us a vastly overrated institution, Mr. Lomas, she murmured. I venture to think the world was not created merely to give women an opportunity to wear Paris frocks. I'm rather pleased to hear you say that. Why? asked Dick on his guard. We're all so dreadfully tired of being goddesses. For centuries foolish men have set us up on a pedestal and vowed they were unworthy to touch the hem of our garments. And it is so dull. What a clever woman you are, Mrs. Crowley. You always say what you don't mean. You're really very rude. Now that impropriety is out of fashion, rudeness is the only shortcut to a reputation for wit. Canon Spratter did not like Dick. He thought he talked too much. It was fortunately easy to change the conversation. Unlike Mr. Lomas, I thoroughly enjoy a dance, he said, turning to Lady Kelsey. My tastes are ingenuous, and I can only hope you've enjoyed your evening as much as your guests. I? cried Lady Kelsey. I've been suffering agonies. They all knew to what she referred, and the remark gave Bulger an opportunity to speak to Dick Lomas. I suppose you saw the mail this morning? he asked. I never read the papers except in August, answered Dick dryly. When there's nothing in them, asked Mrs. Crowley. Pardon me, I am an eager student of the sea serpent and of the giant gooseberry. I should like to kick that man, said Bobby indignantly. Dick smiled. My dear chap, Alec is a hardy Scot and bigger than you. I really shouldn't advise you to try. Of course you've heard all about this business, said Canon Spratter. I've only just arrived from Paris. I knew nothing of it till Lady Kelsey told me. What do you think? I don't think at all. I know there's not a word of truth in it. Since Alec arrived at Mombasa, he's been acclaimed by everyone, private and public, who had any right to an opinion. Of course it couldn't last. There was bound to be a reaction. Do you know anything of this man, McKinnery? asked Bulger. It so happens that I do. 
Alec found him half-starving at Mombasa and took him solely out of charity. But he was a worthless rascal and had to be sent back. He seems to me to give ample proof for every word he says, retorted Bobby. Dick shrugged his shoulders scornfully. As I've already explained to Lady Kelsey, whenever an explorer comes home, there's someone to tell nasty stories about him. People forget that kid gloves are not much use in a tropical forest, and they grow very indignant when they hear that a man has used a little brute force to make himself respected. All that's beside the point, said Bolger impatiently. Mackenzie sent poor George into a confounded trap to save his own dirty skin. Poor Lucy, moaned Lady Kelsey. First her father died. And you're not going to count that as an overwhelming misfortune, Dick interrupted. We were unanimous in describing that gentleman's demise as an uncommon happy release. I was engaged to dine with him this evening, said Bobby, pursuing his own bitter reflections. I wired to say I had a headache and couldn't come. What will he think if he sees you here? cried Lady Kelsey. He can think what he likes. Canon Spratter felt that it was needful now to put in the decisive word which he always expected from himself. He rubbed his hands blandly. In this matter, I must say I agree entirely with our friend Bobby. I read the letter with the utmost care, and I could see no loophole of escape. Until Mr. Mackenzie gives a definite answer, I can hardly help looking upon him as nothing less than a murderer. In these things, I feel that one should have the courage of one's opinions. I saw him in Piccadilly this evening, and I cut him dead. Nothing will induce me to shake hands with a man on whom rests so serious an accusation. I hope to goodness he doesn't come, said Lady Kelsey. Canon Spratter looked at his watch and gave her a reassuring smile. I think you may feel quite safe. It's really growing very late. You say that Lucy doesn't know anything about this? asked Dick. No, said Lady Kelsey. I wanted to give her this evening's enjoyment unalloyed. Dick shrugged his shoulders again. He did not understand how Lady Kelsey expected no suggestion to reach Lucy of a matter which seemed a common topic of conversation. The pause which followed Lady Kelsey's words was not broken when Lucy herself appeared. She was accompanied by a spruce young man, to whom she turned with a smile. I thought we should find your partner here. He went to Grace Vizard, and claiming her for the dance that was about to begin, took her away. Lucy went up to Lady Kelsey and leaned over the chair in which she sat. Are you growing very tired, my aunt? she asked kindly. I can rest myself till supper time. I don't think anyone else will come now. Have you forgotten Mr. Mackenzie? Lady Kelsey looked up quickly, but did not reply. Lucy put her hand gently on her aunt's shoulder. My dear, it was charming of you to hide the paper from me this morning, but it wasn't very wise. Did you see that letter? cried Lady Kelsey. I so wanted you not to till tomorrow. No, Mr. Mackenzie very rightly thought I should know at once what was said about him and my brother. He sent me the paper himself this evening. Did he write to you? asked Dick. No, he merely scribbled on a card. I think you should read this. No one answered. Lucy turned and faced them. Her cheeks were pale, but she was very calm. She looked gravely at Robert Bulger, waiting for him to say what she knew was in his mind, so that she might express at once her utter disbelief in the charges that were brought against Alec but he did not speak, and she was obliged to utter her defiant words without provocation. He thought it unnecessary to assure me that he hadn't betrayed the trust I put in him. Do you mean to say the letter left any doubt in your mind? said Bulger. Why on earth should I believe the unsupported words of a subordinate who was dismissed for misbehavior? For my part, I can only say that I never read anything more convincing in my life. I could hardly believe him guilty of such a crime if he confessed it with his own lips. Bobby shrugged his shoulders. It was only with difficulty that he held back the cruel words that were on his lips. 
but as if Lucy read his thoughts, her cheeks flushed. I think it's infamous that you should all be ready to believe the worst, she said hotly, in a low voice that trembled with indignant anger. You're all of you so petty, so mean, that you welcome the chance of spattering with mud a man who is so infinitely above you. You've not given him a chance to defend himself. Bobby turned very pale. Lucy had never spoken to him in such a way before, and wrath flamed up in his heart, wrath mixed with hopeless love. He paused for a moment to command himself. You don't know apparently that interviewers went to him from the evening papers, and he refused to speak. He has never consented to be interviewed. Why should you expect him now to break his rule? Bobby was about to answer, when a sudden look of dismay on Lady Kelsey's face stopped him. He turned round and saw Mackenzie standing at the door. He came forward with a smile, holding out his hand, and addressed himself to Lady Kelsey. I thought I should find you here, he said. He was perfectly collected. He glanced around the room with a smile of quiet amusement. A certain embarrassment seized the little party, and Lady Kelsey, as she shook hands with him, was at a loss for words. How do you do? she faltered. We've just been talking of you. Really? The twinkle in his eyes caused her to lose the remainder of her self-possession, and she turned scarlet. It's so late we were afraid you wouldn't come. I should have been dreadfully disappointed. It's very kind of you to say so. I've been at the Travellers, reading various appreciations of my character. A hurried look of alarm crossed Lady Kelsey's good-tempered face. Oh, I heard there was something about you in the papers, she answered. There's a good deal. I really had no idea the world was so interested in me. It's charming of you to come here tonight, the good lady smiled, beginning to feel more at ease. I'm sure you hate dances. Oh, no, they interest me enormously. I remember an African king once gave a dance in my honor, four thousand warriors in war paint. I assure you, it was a most impressive sight. My dear fellow, Dick chuckled, if paint is the attraction, you really need not go much further than Mayfair. The scene amused him. He was deeply interested in Alec's attitude, for he knew him well enough to be convinced that his discreet gaiety was entirely assumed. It was impossible to tell by it what course he meant to adopt, and at the same time there was about him a greater unapproachableness which warned all and sundry that it would be wiser to attempt no advance. But for his own part he did not care. He meant to have a word with Alec at the first opportunity. Alec's quiet eyes now rested on Robert Bulger. Ah, there's my little friend Bobbikins. I thought you had a headache. Lady Kelsey remembered her nephew's broken engagement and interposed quickly. I'm afraid Bobby is dreadfully dissipated. He's not looking at all well. You shouldn't keep such late hours, said Alec, good-humouredly. At your age, one needs one's beauty sleep. It's very kind of you to take an interest in me, said Bolger, flushing with annoyance. My headache has passed off. I'm very glad. What do you use? Phenacetin? It went away of its own accord after dinner, returned Bobby frigidly, conscious that he was being laughed at, but unable to extricate himself. Now, so you resolve to give the girls a treat by coming to Lady Kelsey's dance? How nice of you not to disappoint them. Alec turned to Lucy and they looked into one another's eyes. I sent you a paper this evening, he said gravely. It was very good of you. There was a silence. All who were present felt that the moment was impressive, and it needed Canon Spratter's determination to allow none but himself to monopolize attention, to bring to an end a situation which might have proved awkward. He came forward and offered his arm to Lucy. I think this is my dance. May I take you in? He was trying to repeat the direct cut which he had given Alec earlier in the day. Alec looked at him. I saw you in Piccadilly this evening. You were dashing about like a young gazelle. I didn't see you, said the canon frigidly. 
I observed that you were deeply engrossed in the shop windows as I passed. How are you? He held out his hand. For a moment the canon hesitated to take it, but Alec's gaze compelled him. How do you do? he said. He felt, rather than heard, Dick's chuckle and reddening offered his arm to Lucy. Won't you come, Mr. Mackenzie? said Lady Kelsey, making the best of her difficulty. If you don't mind, I'll stay and smoke a cigarette with Dick Lomas. You know, I'm not a dancing man. It seemed that Alec was giving Dick the opportunity he sought, and as soon as they found themselves alone, the sprightly little man attacked him. I suppose you know we were all beseeching Providence you'd have the grace to stay away tonight, he said. I confess that I suspected it, smiled Alec. I shouldn't have come, only I wanted to see Miss Allerton. This fellow McKinnery proposes to make things rather uncomfortable, I imagine. I made a mistake, didn't I? said Alec, with a thin smile. I should have dropped him in the river when I had no further use for him. What are you going to do? Nothing. Dick stared at him. Do you mean to say you're going to sit still and let them throw mud at you? If they want to. But look here, Alec. What the deuce is the meaning of the whole thing? Alec looked at him quietly. If I had intended to take the world in general into my confidence, I wouldn't have refused to see the interviewers who came to me this evening. We've known one another for twenty years, Alec, said Dick. Then you may be quite sure that if I refuse to discuss this matter with you, it must be for excellent reasons. Dick sprang up excitedly. But good God! You must explain. You can't let a charge like this rest on you. After all, it's not Tom, Dick, or Harry that's concerned. It's Lucy's brother. You must speak. I've never yet discovered that I must do anything that I don't choose, answered Alec. Dick flung himself into a chair. He knew that when Alec spoke in that fashion, no power on earth could move him. The whole thing was entirely unexpected, and he was at a loss for words. He had not read the letter which was causing all the bother, and knew only what Lady Kelsey had told him. He had some hope that on a close examination various things would appear which must explain Alec's attitude, but at present it was incomprehensible. "'Has it occurred to you that Lucy is very much in love with you, Alec?' he said at last. Alec did not answer. He made no movement. "'What will you do if this loses you her love?' I have counted the cost, said Alec coldly. He got up from his chair, and Dick saw that he did not wish to continue the discussion. There was a moment of silence, and then Lucy came in. I've given my partner away to a wallflower, she said, with a faint smile. I felt I must have a few words alone with you. I will make myself scarce, said Dick. They waited till he was gone. Then Lucy turned feverishly to Alec. Oh, I'm so glad you've come. I wanted so much to see you. Nanette! I'm afraid people have been telling you horrible things about me. They wanted to hide it from me. It never occurred to me that people could say such shameful things, he said gravely. It tormented him a little because it had been so easy to care nothing for the world's adulation, and it was so hard to care as little for its censure. He felt very bitter. He took Lucy's hand and made her sit on the sofa by his side. There's something I must tell you at once. She looked at him without answering. I've made up my mind to give no answer to the charges that are brought against me. Lucy looked up quickly, and their eyes met. I give you my word of honor that I've done nothing which I regret. I swear to you that what I did was right with regard to George, and if it were all to come again... I would do exactly as I did before. She did not answer for a long time. I never doubted you for a single moment, she said at last. That is all I care about. He looked down, and there was a certain shyness in his voice when he spoke again. Today is the first time I've wanted to be assured that I was trusted, and yet I'm ashamed to want it. Don't be too hard upon yourself, she said gently. You're so afraid of letting your tenderness appear. 
He seemed to give earnest thought to what she said. Lucy had never seen him more grave. The only way to be strong is never to surrender to one's weakness. Strength is merely a habit. I want you to be strong, too. I want you never to doubt me whatever you hear said. I gave my brother into your hands, and I said that if he died a brave man's death, I could ask for no more. You told me that such a death was his. I thought of you always, and everything I did was for your sake. Every single act of mine during these four years in Africa has been done because I loved you. It was the first time since his return that he had spoken of love. Lucy bent her head still lower. Do you remember I asked you a question before I went away? You refused to marry me then, but you told me that if I asked again when I came back, the answer might be different. Yes. The hope bore me up in every difficulty and in every danger, and when I came back I dared not ask you at once. I was so afraid that you would refuse once more, and I didn't wish you to think yourself bound by a vague promise. But each day I loved you more passionately. I knew, and I was very grateful for your love. Yesterday I could have offered you a certain name. I only cared for the honours they gave me so that I might put them at your feet. But what can I offer you now? You must love me always, Alec, for now I have only you. And are you sure that you will never believe that I am guilty of this crime? Why can you say nothing in self-defence? That I can't tell you either. There was a silence between them. At last, Alec spoke again. But perhaps it will be easier for you to believe in me than for others, because you know that I loved you, and I can't have done the odious thing of which that man accuses me. I will never believe it. I do not know what your reasons are for keeping all this to yourself, but I trust you, and I know that they are good. If you cannot speak, it is because greater interests hold you back. I love you, Alec, with all my heart, and if you wish me to be your wife, I shall be proud and honoured. He took her in his arms, and as he kissed her, she wept tears of happiness. She did not want to think. She wanted merely to surrender herself to his strength. Sixteen. Lady Kelsey's devout hope that her party would finish without unpleasantness was singularly frustrated. Robert Bulger was irritated beyond endurance by the things Lucy had said to him, and Lucy besides, as if to drive him to distraction, had committed a peculiar indiscretion. In her determination to show the world in general, represented then by the two hundred people who were enjoying Lady Kelsey's hospitality, that she, the person most interested, did not for an instant believe what was said about Alec, Lucy had insisted on dancing with him. Alec thought it unwise thus to outrage conventional opinion, but he could not withstand her fiery spirit. Dick and Mrs. Crowley were partners at the time, and the disapproval which Lucy saw in their eyes made her more vehement in her defiance. She had caught Bobby's glance, too, and she flung back her head a little as she saw his livid anger. Little by little Lady Kelsey's guests bade her farewell, and at three o'clock few were left. Lucy had asked Alec to remain till the end, and he and Dick had taken refuge in the smoking-room. Presently Bolger came in with two men, named Malins and Carberry, whom Alec knew slightly. He glanced at Alec and went up to the table on which were cigarettes and various things to drink. His companions had no idea that he was bent upon an explanation and had asked them of set purpose to come into that room. "'May we smoke here, Bobby?' asked one of them, a little embarrassed at seeing Alec, but anxious to carry things off pleasantly. Certainly, Dick insisted that this room should be particularly reserved for that purpose. Lady Kelsey is the most admirable of all hostesses, said Dick lightly. He took out his case and offered a cigarette to Alec. Alec took it. Give me a match, Bobbikins. There's a good boy, he said carelessly. Bolger, with his back turned to Alec, took no notice of the request. He poured himself out some whiskey and, raising the glass, deliberately examined how much there was in it. 
Alex smiled faintly. Bobby, throw me over the matches, he repeated. At that moment, Lady Kelsey's butler came into the room with a salver upon which he put the dirty glasses. Bobby, his back still turned, looked up at the servant. Miller. Yes, sir. Mr. Mackenzie is asking for something. Yes, sir. You might give me a match, will you? said Alec. Yes, sir. The butler put the matches on his salver and took them over to Alec, who lit his cigarette. Thank you. No one spoke till the butler left the room. Alec occupied himself idly in making smoke rings, and he watched them rise into the air. When they were alone, he turned slowly to Bulger. I perceive that during my absence you have not added good manners to your other accomplishments, he said. Bulger wheeled round and faced him. If you want things, you can ask servants for them. Don't be foolish, smiled Alec, good-humouredly. Alec's contemptuous manner robbed Bulger of his remaining self-control. He strode angrily to Alec. If you talk to me like that, I'll knock you down. Alec was lying stretched out on the sofa and did not stir. He seemed completely unconcerned. You could hardly do that when I'm already lying on my back, he murmured. Bulger clenched his fists. He gasped in the fury of his anger. Look here, Mackenzie, I'm not going to let you play the fool with me. I want to know what answer you have to make to McKinnery's accusation. Might I suggest that only Miss Allerton has the least right to receive answers to her questions? And she hasn't questioned me. I've given up trying to understand her attitude. If I were she, it would make me sick with horror to look at you. But after all, I have the right to know something. George Allerton was my cousin. Alec rose slowly from the sofa. He faced Bulger with an indifference which was peculiarly irritating. That is a fact upon which he did not vastly pride himself. Since this morning, you've rested under a perfectly direct charge of causing his death in a dastardly manner, and you've said nothing in self-defense. I haven't. You've been given an opportunity of explaining yourself, and you haven't taken it. Quite true. What are you going to do? Alec had already been asked that question by Dick, and he returned the same answer. Nothing. Bobby looked at him for an instant. Then he shrugged his shoulders. In that case, I can draw only one conclusion. There appears to be no means of bringing you to justice, but at least I can tell you what an indescribable blackguard I think you. All is over between us, smiled Alec, faintly amused at the young man's violence. And shall I return your letters and your photographs? I assure you that I'm not joking, answered Bobby grimly. I have observed that you joke with difficulty. It's singular that though I'm Scotch and you are English, I should be able to see how ridiculous you are while you're quite blind to your own absurdity. Come, Alec, remember he's only a boy remonstrated Dick, who till now had been unable to interpose. Bulger turned upon him angrily. I'm perfectly able to look after myself, Dick, and I'll thank you not to interfere. He looked again at Alec. If Lucy's so indifferent to her brother's death that she's willing to keep up with you, that's her own affair. Dick interrupted once more. For heaven's sake, don't make a scene, Bobby. How can you make such a fool of yourself? Leave me alone, confound you. Do you think this is quite the best place for an altercation? asked Alec quietly. Wouldn't you gain more notoriety if you attacked me in my club or at church parade on Sunday? It's mere shameless impudence that you should come here tonight, cried Bobby, his voice hoarse with passion. You're using these wretched women as a shield because you know that as long as Lucy sticks to you, there are people who won't believe the story. I came for the same reason as yourself, dear boy, because I was invited. You acknowledge that you have no defense. Pardon me, I acknowledge nothing and deny nothing. That won't do for me, said Bolger. I want the truth, and I'm going to get it. I've got a right to know. Don't make such an ass of yourself, cried Alec shortly. By God, I'll make you answer. 
he went up to Alec furiously, as if he meant to seize him by the throat. But Alec, with a twist of the arm, hurled him backwards. I could break your back, you silly boy, he cried, in a voice low with anger. With a cry of rage, Bobby was about to spring at Alec when Dick got in his way. For God's sake, let us have no scenes here, and you'll only get the worst of it, Bobby. Alec could just crumple you up. He turned to the two men who stood behind, startled by the unexpectedness of the quarrel. Take him away, Malins. There's a good chap. Let me alone, you fool, cried Bobby. Come along, old man, said Malins, recovering himself. When his two friends had got Bobby out of the room, Dick heaved a great sigh of relief. Poor Lady Kelsey, he laughed, beginning to see the humour of the situation. Tomorrow, half London will be saying that you and Bobby had a stand-up fight in her drawing room. Alec looked at him angrily. He was not a man of easy temper, and the effort he had put upon himself was beginning to tell. You really needn't have gone out of your way to infuriate the boy, said Dick. Alec wheeled round wrathfully. The damned cubs, he said. I should like to break their silly necks. You have an amiable character, Alec, retorted Dick. Alec began to walk up and down excitedly. Dick had never seen him before in such a state. The position is growing confoundedly awkward, he said dryly. Then Alec burst out. They lick my boots till I loathe them, and then they turn against me like a pack of curs. Oh, I despise them, these silly boys who stay at home wallowing in their ease, while men work, work and conquer. Thank God I've done with them now. They think one can fight one's way through Africa as easily as walk down Piccadilly. They think one goes through hardship and danger illness and starvation to be the lion of a dinner party in Mayfair. I think you're unfair to them, answered Dick. Can't you see the other side of the picture? You're accused of a particularly low act of treachery. Your friends were hoping that you'd be able to prove at once that it was an abominable lie, and for some reason which no one can make out, you refuse even to notice it. My whole life is proof that it's a lie. Don't you think you'd better change your mind and make a statement that can be sent to the papers? No, damn you! Dick's good nature was imperturbable, and he was not in the least annoyed by Alec's vivacity. My dear chap, do calm down, he laughed. Alec started at the sound of his mocking. He seemed again to become aware of himself. It was interesting to observe the quite visible effort he made to regain his self-control. In a moment, he had mastered his excitement, and he turned to Dick with studied nonchalance. Do you think I look wildly excited? he asked blandly. Dick smiled. If you will permit me to say so, I think butter would have no difficulty in melting in your mouth, he replied. I never felt cooler in my life. Lucky man! with the thermometer at a hundred and two. Alec laughed and put his arm through Dick's. Perhaps we had better go home, he said. Your common sense is no less remarkable than your personal appearance, answered Dick gravely. They had already bidden their hostess good night, and getting their things, they set out to walk their different ways. When Dick got home, he did not go to bed. He sat in an armchair, considering the events of the evening and trying to find some way out of the complexity of his thoughts. He was surprised when the morning sun sent a bright ray of light into his room. But Lady Kelsey was not yet at the end of her troubles. Bobby, having got rid of his friends, went to her and asked if she would not come downstairs and drink a cup of soup. The poor lady, quite exhausted, thought him very considerate. One or two persons with their coats on were still in the room, waiting for their womenkind, and in the hall there was a little group of belated guests huddled around the door, while cabs and carriages were being brought up for them. There was about everyone the lassitude which follows the gaiety of a dance. The waiters behind the tables were heavy-eyed. Lucy was bidding goodbye to one or two more intimate friends. Lady Kelsey drank the hot soup with relief. 
My poor legs are dropping, she said. I'm sure I'm far too tired to go to sleep. I want to talk to Lucy before I go, said Bobby abruptly. Tonight, she asked in dismay. Yes, I want you to send her a message that you wish to see her in your boudoir. Why, what on earth's the matter? She can't go on in this way. It's perfectly monstrous. Something must be done immediately. Lady Kelsey understood what he was driving at. She knew how great was his love, and she too had seen his anger when Lucy danced with Alec Mackenzie. But the whole affair perplexed her utterly. She put down her cup. Can't you wait till tomorrow? she asked nervously. I feel it ought to be settled at once. I think you're dreadfully foolish. You know how Lucy resents any interference with her actions. I shall bear her resentment with fortitude, he said, with great bitterness. Lady Kelsey looked at him helplessly. What do you want me to do? she asked. I want you to be present at our interview. He turned to a servant and told him to ask Miss Allerton from Lady Kelsey if she would kindly come to the boudoir. He gave his arm to Lady Kelsey and they went upstairs. In a moment, Lucy appeared. Did you send for me, my aunt? I'm told you want to speak to me here. I asked Aunt Alice to beg you to come here, said Bolger. I was afraid you wouldn't if I asked you. Lucy looked at him with raised eyebrows and answered lightly. What nonsense! I'm always delighted to enjoy your society. I wanted to speak to you about something, and I thought Aunt Alice should be present. Lucy gave him a quick glance. He met it coolly. Is it so important that it can't wait till tomorrow? I venture to think it's very important, and by now... Everybody has gone. I'm all attention, she smiled. Bolger hesitated for a moment, then braced himself for the ordeal. I've told you often, Lucy, that I've been desperately in love with you for more years than I can remember, he said, flushing with nervousness. Surely you've not snatched me from my last chance of a cup of soup in order to make me a proposal of marriage? I'm perfectly serious, Lucy. I assure you it doesn't suit you at all, she smiled. The other day I asked you again to marry me, just before Alec Mackenzie came back. A softer light came into Lucy's eyes, and the bantering tones fell away from her voice. It was very charming of you, she said gravely. You mustn't think that because I laugh at you a little. I'm not very grateful for your affection. You know how long he's cared for you, Lucy, said Lady Kelsey. Lucy went up to him and very tenderly placed her hand on his arm. I'm immensely touched by your great devotion, Bobby, and I know that I've done nothing to deserve it. I'm very sorry that I can't give you anything in return. One's not mistress of one's love. I can only hope, with all my heart, that you'll fall in love with some girl who cares for you. You don't know how much I want you to be happy. Bulger drew back coldly. He would not allow himself to be touched, though the sweetness of her voice tore his heart strings. Just now it's not my happiness that's concerned, he said. When Alec Mackenzie came back, I thought I saw why nothing that I could do had the power to change the utter indifference with which you looked at me. He paused a moment and coughed uneasily. I don't know why you think it necessary to say all this, said Lucy in a low voice. I tried to resign myself. You've always worshipped strength, and I understood that you must think Alec Mackenzie very wonderful. I had little enough to offer you when I compared myself with him. I hoped against hope that you weren't in love with him. Well, except for that letter in this morning's paper, I should never have dared to say anything to you again. But that changes everything. He paused once more. Though he tried to seem so calm, his heart was beating furiously. He really loved Lucy with all his soul, and he was doing what seemed to him a plain duty. I ask you again if you'll be my wife. I don't understand what you mean, she said slowly. You can't marry Alec Mackenzie now. Lucy flung back her head. She grew very pale. You have no right to talk to me like this, she said. 
you really presume too much upon my good nature? I think I have some right. I'm the only man who's related to you at all, and I love you. They saw that Lady Kelsey wanted to speak, and Lucy turned round to her. I think you should listen to him, Lucy. I'm growing old, and soon you'll be quite alone in the world. The simple kindness of her words calmed the passions of the other two and brought down the conversation to a gentler level. I'll try my best to make you a good husband, Lucy, said Bobby, very earnestly. I don't ask you to care for me. I only want to serve you. I can only repeat that I'm very grateful to you. But I can't marry you, and I shall never marry you. Bulger's face grew darker, and he was silent. Are you going to continue to know Alec Mackenzie? he asked at length. You have no right to ask me such a question. If you'll take the advice of any unprejudiced person about that letter, you'll find that he'll say the same as I. There can be no shadow of a doubt that the man is guilty of a monstrous crime. I don't care what the evidence is, said Lucy. I know he can't have done a shameful thing. But good God, have you forgotten that it's your own brother whom he killed? He cried hotly. The whole country is up in arms against him, and you are quite indifferent. Oh, Bobby, how can you say that? She wailed, suddenly moved to the very depths of her being. How can you be so cruel? He went up to her, and they stood face to face. He spoke very quickly, flinging the words at her with indignant anger. If you cared for George at all, you must wish to punish the man who caused his death. At least you can't continue to be his. He stopped as he saw the agony in her eyes and changed his words. His greatest friend. It was your doing that George went to Africa at all. The least thing you can do is to take some interest in his death. She put up her hands to her eyes, as though to drive away the sight of hateful things. Oh, why do you torment me? she cried pitifully. I tell you he isn't guilty. He's refused to answer anyone. I tried to get something out of him, but I couldn't, and I lost my temper. He might give you the truth if you asked him point-blank. I couldn't do that. Why not? It's very strange that he should insist on this silence, said Lady Kelsey. One would have thought if he had nothing to be ashamed of, he'd have nothing to hide. Do you believe that story too? asked Lucy. I don't know what to believe. It's so extraordinary. Dick says he knows nothing about it. If the man's innocent, why on earth doesn't he speak? He knows I trust him, said Lucy. He knows I'm proud to trust him. Do you think I would cause him the great pain of asking him questions? Are you afraid he couldn't answer them? asked Bulger. No, no, no. Well, just try. After all, you owe as much as that to the memory of George. Try. But don't you see that if he won't say anything, it's because there are good reasons, she cried distractedly. How do I know what interests are concerned in the matter, beside which the death of George is insignificant? Do you look upon it so lightly as that? She turned away, bursting into tears. She was like a hunted beast. There seemed no escape from the taunting questions. I must show my faith in him, she sobbed. I think you're a little nervous to go into the matter too closely. I believe in him implicitly. I believe in him with all the strength I've got. Then surely it can make no difference if you ask him. There can be no reason for him not to trust you. Oh, why don't you leave me alone? she wailed. I do think it's very unreasonable, Lucy, said Lady Kelsey. He knows you're his friend. He can surely count on your discretion. If he refused to answer me, it would mean nothing. You don't know him as I do. He's a man of extraordinary character. If he has made up his mind that for certain reasons which we don't know, he must preserve an entire silence. Nothing whatever will move him. Why should he answer? I believe in him absolutely. I think he's the greatest and most honourable man I've ever known. I should feel happy and grateful to be allowed to wait on him. Lucy, what do you mean? cried Lady Kelsey. But now Lucy had cast off all reserve. She did not mind what she said. 
I mean that I care more for his little finger than for the whole world. I love him with all my heart, and that's why he can't be guilty of this horrible thing, because I've loved him for years, and he's known it, and he loves me, and he's loved me always. She sank exhausted into a chair, gasping for breath. Bulger looked at her for a moment, and he turned sick with anguish. What he had only suspected before, he knew now from her own lips, and it was harder than ever to bear. Now everything seemed ended. Are you going to marry him? he asked. Yes. In spite of everything? In spite of everything, she answered defiantly. Bobby choked down the groan of despairing rage that forced its way to his throat. He watched her for a moment. Good God, he said at last. What is there in the man that he should have made you forget love and honour and common decency? Lucy made no reply, but she buried her face in her hands and wept. She rocked to and fro with the violence of her tears. Without another word, Bobby turned round and left them. Lady Kelsey heard the door slam as he went out into the silent street.